Chris Campbell, my friend, it is such a pleasure to have you on the Investing in Integrity podcast. Um, before we dive in, how are you and where are you calling in from? I am in sunny Miami. Um, it's been a, uh, it's been a, it's always a good place to hide out over winter. And it's uh, certainly this winter is not uh, any, any different that it's as a lot of my friends in New York and in the Northeast are, are, are battling snow right now. I'm battling sun. So uh, not, not a bad thing. You were one of the many who flocked from New York down to Miami, right? Yeah, I actually kind of beat the the crowd down here. I got to here a little before uh, this became the sixth borough of New York City. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's been yeah, it's been great. It's really been and it's really it's been interesting to see how much of New York has actually moved down. It's you know there's so many new restaurants here that are from New York or a lot of friends and um, you know, membership clubs or whatever. It's just really been a, a kind of fun and fascinated to watch this migration down south of funds and of companies and uh, entrepreneurs and industries. It's really going to, it's been a real uh, interesting thing. I really kind of see this around the country, right? There's been a big, great migration, uh, you know, to Texas and the intermountain West and, and uh, to Southern Florida. It's funny, uh, Maya, my fiance and I, we've had a number of conversations about where we want to live full time one day and the Bay area where we are now, it's always been firm in our minds. But only in the last 12 months, when people ask that question, I sort of stutter now. And I'm like, well, I love the Bay Area. I still intend on staying here for good. But there's a little bit of hesitation where I'm like, oh, Miami or Austin seems so great right now. And so many of my friends have moved there. Um, so I'm, I'm jealous. I appreciate you uh, having a guest bedroom when some of us can actually come visit Miami and making it easy to come visit and stay. Um, Chris, I want to dive right in. I want to dive right in. I have so many questions for you. I've been really looking forward to our episode because I think you have a uniquely interesting story to tell. Um, most of the guests that we have on this podcast, they are investors through and through. They've been in financial services almost their entire career. And you've had a very interesting journey, both in the public sector and the private sector. And beyond the variety of experience that you've had, you also just have an incredibly unique life story. Um, in fact, uh, many, many people that I've talked to in the past um, who, who know you, some of our mutual friends, have all commented on how interesting your story is and how memorable your story is. Um, so how about we dive right in? Can you just begin by telling us, our audience your story? Yeah, sure, of course. I grew up pretty humbly in a very small city called Hemet in Southern California, uh, which is pretty much equidistant between uh, the ocean and Palm Springs. Uh, so, um, and so the high desert, uh, so heat is, is definitely not, living in the heat is definitely not a, something I'm, I'm not unfamiliar with, um, but I grew up, uh, I'm one of six kids, um, actually five of six. Uh, there was, there was 11 year gap between myself and my next older brother. Uh, and somewhere in that 11 years, um, we're same parents, but some, somewhere in that 11 years between my next older brother and myself, um, things got really difficult economically for my family. And so uh, we became episodically homeless most of my life. Um, and, uh, uh, my father was largely absent from most of my, my childhood. And when he was there, he was pretty, um, abusive. And so I decided, uh, when I was 16 to, um, along with my baby sister to leave home and we, which we did and, and, uh, became fin financially independent since then. And so I, uh, um, you know, worked very hard to, to, uh, network and to, to do everything you could to really survive it being a janitor and uh where where whatever else we could do to to make money um and uh but for a couple people in politics that really leaned in and really showed me a future a vision of a future that i otherwise would not have had um i you know likely would still be back in that really difficult spot um where a lot of my contemporaries are in prison or or uh, drug drug addicted and so um uh, you know um, I started out campaigning uh, in politics. I uh, found a real knack for it. Um, I really, I just found it was a lot of fun and and uh, you know, selling ideas. I just something I really loved and, and really I took a uh, a real keen interest in. Um, that later led me to um, a really close relationship, almost like a father and son relationship, really with um, a U.S. senator named Orrin Hatch from Utah who brought me back to, D, back, back to DC to help him um, administer and run the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, a committee that 
uh, called the Drugs and Thugs Committee. It does all anti-drug policy and crime policy, but as well as choosing federal judges, um, uh, all different kinds of federal judges, including the Supreme Court. So I had a, I had a, a, a uh, so a part in choosing some of the justices on the Supreme Court and getting getting to know the court very well. Um, I'm gratefully and very happily not a lawyer, um, and uh, and very quickly recognized and realized that the Judiciary Committee, um, although it does an amazing work for the country and has an amazing bevy of, of senators that serve on it, um, is a very partisan committee, probably one of the most partisan committees on Capitol Hill. Um, and it's just not naturally how I'm geared. And so I decided to leave and got uh, and get an MBA. Um, I did, and uh, uh, which took, took me out to Arizona. Started some companies during my MBA process, program um, and was then called back to DC by Senator Hatch and other members to help run the Senate Finance Committee, um, which is the, uh, in contrast to the Judiciary Committee, the my most bipartisan committee on Capitol Hill. Um, it has uh, effectively does all of the, the economic issues, all of the money issues, um, spent mostly the spending issues in DC. So it's in charge of 70% of uh, outgoing spending in the government and 100% of incoming revenue. So all tax policy, all trade policy, all in, uh, entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, welfare, uh, interest on the debt and the debt ceiling, managing all of that uh, was all over our purview. And so um, while there uh, during, that's called the Obama years, um, I was uh, the lead negotiator on economic issues on behalf of the U.S. Senate. Um, so I, you know, I got to know very well the then Vice President, the current President of the United States, and the team that Obama has, had assembled, um, including the President um, and, his, and his cabinet, to really tend to get what we can, what we could get done. Um, you know, I am a Republican. Um, uh, by registration, but I'm a really bipartisan person. And so I always try to attack a problem in a way that that's, uh, you know, both sides win and hopefully win, win equally. Um, not, you don't, I can't always win uh, at every time. So I can't say that every negotiation was was successful, but we certainly tried to do our best to make sure that every negotiation was successful. Um, uh, Obama cycled out um, of the race. There was, uh, President Trump won. Um, he chose, Stephen Mnuchin at the time, Steve Mnuchin, um, to be a secretary of treasury a nominee. Um, that nomination had to go through the finance committee first before it was considered on the US Senate floor. Um, during that process, uh, what would later become secretary Mnuchin um, uh, and I became very close talking quite often um, during that process. And so uh, when he was confirmed uh, by the Senate eventually, uh, it took a long time to get that done, but um, when he was eventually confirmed, um, he asked me to join him in the cabinet. Um, and uh, you know, I, after doing some soul searching and talking to some Democrats and Republicans and, other, and many other folks uh, that I trusted, um, I got uh, I, I accepted the the nomination um, from President Trump to be confirmed um, at the Department of Treasury, where I was unanimously confirmed. Um, by all 100 senators uh, and um, uh, served there for two years uh, and then left um, uh, Treasury to join a firm called Duff and Phelps, which has now been rebranded re as Kroll as their chief strategist. Uh, during that time, we sold the firm, um, did a, a transfer, private transfer from uh, sponsorship. Um, and, uh, and in addition to do what I, what my work, I do at now Kroll, um, I do a, a great deal of, um, uh, advisory work, uh, for equity with companies that are of all different sizes, but mostly in FinTech and, and, uh, and healthcare. I also do my own, um, uh, investing. I'm a teacher back at the schools that I, I went to, went to, I did an undergrad and started my, on my MBA program. Um, with and uh, I'm a contributor to uh, several different news outlets, um, and so I, I often say, and Ross, and I, you're probably sick of hearing this, but I, I just I've lived I lived such an incredibly blessed life. I live a life that I that I should not have lived, and and um, every single day of my life, I know that the benefits I have and the uh, uh, the privilege that that I now live in um, is something that is it can evaporate tomorrow. Um, and so I feel an incredible obligation 
to mentor and try to find ways of, of opening up the uh, opening up the ideas and, and um, opportunities for folks that don't have or perhaps don't don't see a path um, out of where they're at currently. Um, I can tell you, I can personally attest to you that with hard work um, and you know, grace of God or uh, you know, or some whatever you believe in, um, you know, it can really um, incredible things can happen. Um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and any, anyone, it's possible for anyone, right? I mean, other than being um, born in the United States, a male and white, um, I really wasn't given much in, in this world. And so um, I, you know, I, I, I try to love as many as much as much as I can and try to give as give back as much as I can in me, very meaningful ways. And, and, um, and that journey can lead brought me to you, Ross, uh, and uh, uh, which I'm grateful for to, to um, about what you're building and, and to making sure that folks know that that uh, in my terms, um, that conscious capitalism can be really, really impactful and very meaningful to folks and having, uh, you know, you can you can be in finance and make a lot of money um and involved in great companies doing amazing things and still make a real impact um in the world that can be exceptionally meaningful and leave an imprint knowing that whatever you touched is better than to, than than before you touched it um and that uh, you have an obligation to be able to um to make sure that you give a, a hand up or, or an op opportunity or, or um, you know, some benefit to folks that, that don't have what you have, because again, it's, you know, one wrong move or waking up the wrong side of the bed or for, for whatever reason, that can all go away. And, um, and uh, again, just recognizing how, just how lucky uh, we are and, and uh, you know, the, the, the small part we can play in other people's lives, um, it can be just such an amazing um, thing and it really can be deeply impactful. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what you're doing. Well, well, thanks. I, I appreciate that. And it means a lot. And I really appreciate you sharing your story in, in, in detail. I think I'm, I, I could know, I can say with confidence, I'm sure all of our listeners probably have a thousand questions just hearing your story. Um, I only have about 20, so I'll, I'll try to get through as many of them as I can. Um, listening. I've, I've heard your story before, but even hearing it again, I, I still have new questions. The first question I want to ask Chris is, you know, you've been an incredible friend by helping me muster up the courage to tell my own life story as well. Um, you know, I have some kind of challenges in childhood, some vulnerability there. And it was really an, an difficult for me initially to begin sharing my story. I actually remember when I was staying with you in Miami and I had a couple of calls with very, very senior financial executives and you were like, just tell them your story. I looked at you like, what? I, I, I can't. And you're like, trust me, tell them your story. And two meetings back to back, I just went for it. And I told my story. And in both of those meetings, the execs were like, we need to meet again. And I want to get involved and I want to help. And I remember like, Chris, it actually, it, it worked. Like people actually respond to this. And I still even feel vulnerable thinking back to that moment. It was so hard for me. I literally needed you there, like practically over my shoulder, like you got this dude, just, just go for it. Just try it and watch. Um, was it initially difficult for you to share some of the more vulnerable parts of your life story early on? Like you mentioned your, your family, some of those challenges, was that hard at first? Yeah, look, absolutely. I, I, I'm a product of many, many, many years of therapy. So um, I, I think um, I, I can tell you, I personally attest to you that, that really relationships come down to a lot of things, but, but, uh, one of the nubs of them is trust. And uh, one of the aspects of trust is vulnerability. And um, if you can, with confidence, not cockiness, but with confidence, know, own your personal story and know that um, there's really nothing that can be done. Um, you know, you've, you've lived it and hopefully you've had a chance to digest it and kind of put it in, in a perspective so that that can be, you know, healthy and, and meaningful to, uh, so, you know, the good parts, you can enhance the bad parts, you can not relive. Um, and if you can share that in a way that, that, that expresses vulnerability to the folks that you do business with or the people you close, that are closest to your life, um, those relationships become that much more meaningful because uh, trust, again, trust, one of the predicates of trust is vulnerability. And, um, and so I think you, you know, you, 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 it's, it's always counterintuitive 
Um, but I tell you that uh, and you've learned um, that the more you lean in, um, the more meaningful the relationships you have in your life are. And someone that grew up like me, um, you know, with not, I'm not really exceptionally close to my family, uh, except my younger sister. Um, I have, uh, you know, my friends become my family and some of my people, the people I work with become my family. And so that, because of that, I, uh, I can tell you that you can build those bonds with people that are don't, that are not blood relatives that can be even stronger than that of those relationships that are blood, blood related because uh, of you know, just sharing who you are and owning who you are um, and being honest and, and, uh, and vulnerable. I really, really appreciate you unpacking that. I think for a lot of people listening, especially investors in the financial sector, I think there is this reputation that you cannot be vulnerable. You can't look weak. You know, saying one thing that makes you look stupid in front of a client could cost a deal. Um, saying one thing that makes you look soft in front of a managing director could cost you the promotion and a career track at a firm. And so I think for people listening to hear that you have been vulnerable, you've shared, you know, honestly who you are and the struggles and challenges you've been through um, and still been, in, in my opinion, incredibly successful, I think is really important for people to hear. Um, with that, I would actually love to dive into um, some of the later parts of your journey and just kind of walk through some of the parts of your story you shared. First, starting with your public service, if that's all right. Sure. Um, of course, you had mentioned you were unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate right, to become the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Institutions. Can you break down a little bit more how that came about first and also kind of walk us through some of the critical decisions you handled during your tenure in that role? Sure. Uh, the, the role came about actually, uh, you know, through the confirmation process of Secretary, of Secretary Mnuchin. Um, you know, we got became very close. I uh, and my experience in government, um, having gotten to know very well the U.S. senators, especially the senators that wrote uh, that were that were responsible or. or at that time, we didn't know this, but I mean, we're going to become responsible for writing the 2017 tax reform bill, uh, best known as the, the Trump tax cuts. Um, the uh, you know, I think that those relationships were very meaningful to the secretary in the White House, um, and have me on that side, uh, in, in the executive branch, not the legislative branch, um, helping you know, helping that pro process out, which is one of the thing, major things we did, um, and treasury as well as. Uh, reorient um, a set of laws called Dodd Frank um, that uh, they that kind of govern the, the regulatory um, aspect or relationship between Washington and Wall Street um, uh, on, on all, all different kinds of matters, um, and then uh, worked on cybersecurity issues, both offensive and defensive, uh, related to the finan U.S. financial institutions, um, and geez. Uh, um, dealing with the treasuries with the managing uh, our debt the u.s government's debt um and then a relationship between u.s financial institutions and department of treasury at the white house uh was a conduit between that as well had a real significant hand in choosing most of the financial regulators working closely with with uh, the folks in the white house and, and the secretary's office um uh up to and including uh, secretary powell sorry uh, chairman powell of the fed um and uh, been working closely with those regulators, even on my time with Capitol Hill, but um, but very very closely with them um, uh, on a variety of uh, policy issues that we were, were driving um, at uh, Treasury. I wound down, wound down the TARP program um, uh, while I was there. We also did um, some some meaningful changes to the CDFI program, which is a um, program that's an important program that, that allows for. Uh, the banking of traditionally underbanked or non-banked people, um, and uh, you know, just, uh, it's a it's a long list. I could keep going and going, and going, but yeah, we just we did a lot of uh, I called it my treasure years that were kind of like dog years. We did a lot of work um, and uh, with a great team. Uh, and Secretary Mnuchin was a great secretary. I, you know, it's really uh, uh, you know like incredible to work work with and for and um, and uh, yeah. So I think that's. Excited to, to have to have had the opportunity to serve and um, really mean it was very meaningful to me to to be able to be asked and never in a million years would I've ever thought as a kid that I would be you know unanimously confirmed to, to a president's cabinet to help steward anything other than let, let alone the part of the U.S. economy. So um, it was 
you know, a really incredible um, experience. And gosh, I learned so much in the process. Um, it's been, you know, candidly, it's been very meaningful and useful to a lot of my clients now, the companies that, that, I, that I advise. I would imagine so, right? Not, not many people have that experience on the inside and are coming back now over to the financial sector. Um, I'm curious, can you, for those of us listening who have never been in politics, have never been in the public sector, especially in the upper echelons, right, of some would call power and decision making, um, I'm curious, what what is it like in there? You know, how do, how do decisions get made? You know, you hear all these stories about how there's so much political gamesmanship and there's there's all these favors and, and you just hear, I think in the public's, in the public sphere, a very, very negative, like very negative rhetoric about the public sector and how things get done. If you saw Hamilton, you know, there's the whole song, the room where it happens, right? Um, would love to hear from your perspective, what it was like, you know, behind the doors um, in, in Capitol Hill. Um, and how what it was like to try to get things done. Yeah, like so I get I get this question a lot, and I thank you for it. Like I think it's uh, I just get different shades of this question. Um, I'll say that the the far majority of members of Congress are there for the right reasons. Uh, I say far majority. I mean, like the you know there there may be one or two or three outliers that that are you know they're just perhaps not there for the right reasons. Um, but. Uh, that being said, I think that there are, there are different and important constituencies for each party, and every single person that serves in Congress has a very important constituency, uh, either their voters or the companies that, that are in their district or state, um, you know, their governor, their, um, you know, and, so, and then the, uh, there's a whole bunch of money that's uh, that's involved in politics. Camp, uh, campaigning is, is very important, and very important, but also very um, expensive these days and it becoming more expensive. Um, and so, yeah, there's just an enormous amount of, um, of different constituencies and, and obligations and, and uh, viewpoints that have to be reflected in any uh, any deal. Um, you know, I think that any good negotiator or, or, or someone's going to kind of bring down both, bring together both sides and, and come to a deal has to understand those pressure points on both sides. And, and um, also, you know, all too often, um, it's, uh, we don't do this even amongst our friends and, and uh, you know, people that we, everyone uh, interacts with every single day. But, um, you know, I think I've always found that the best uh, like orientation mentally going into any negotiation, or be it a financial, financial um, you know, a deal or something in government or whatever is really not seeing the other person as stupid or misinformed or ill-informed. Um, and because oftentimes what happens, especially in politics, is that if you just think like, oh, they, they just don't know. So if I tell them enough, they're going to realize something. Or if I scream it loud enough, they're going to they're going to change their position. It just doesn't happen. Um, but you have you have to understand where their their you know their, their pressure points are, where their their challenges are, their pain points are, and try to solve those solve those solve those issues. It's the exact same thing in public and private. Um, uh, negotiations, I found. So, um, I, you know, that was my always, always my orientation going in, and, and uh, really meaningfully trying to find a way to get to yes, um, and working hard to make sure that we do. And so, um, on Capitol Hill, it's different than in the in the administration. Um, and so, the executive branch, there is, there, I think it's probably because they're just so. There's a lot of different voices on Capitol Hill. Think, think of it this way. There are 435 members of Congress that are vote that vote um, on bills, and there's 100 U.S. senators, so 535 members of Congress that are elected that can vote on bills. Um, every single one of them, you can kind of think of as a small business that have their own CEO, their own president, their own kind of thing, and none of them report to each other. So they're all independent, and all of them are going to have their different orientations. And as someone who's negotiating or someone who's going to put together a bill or, or something, you have to go to each one of those storefronts, those little small businesses, knock on the door and say, like, what, what can we need? How, how do you, you know, what do you have to sell? What do you, what do you want? Um, and kind of reflect all of their interest um, in a, you know, in a bill that you're going to put together. Um, that is not the way, that same way in the administration, of course, there's one president. Um, ultimately, every single person in the administration works for the president, and so in some capacity. And so, um, and so, you know, while there are dissenting voices and a lot of 
different pressures um, within an, an entire administration. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people, uh, different departments, you know, some people with an international orientation and domestic orientation and labor and that kind of stuff and having all of those voices chide in. Um, but they're not individual storefronts. They're kind of a big, a big company, if you will. It's a very large, very, very large company um, with one CEO and different branches. Um, and so it's 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 managed a bit differently. So there's a lot of box checking that has to take place. Is would be un uh, would be very familiar to a lot of uh, people listening that that really work in very large companies. Um, you know, there's a there's processes in place and that kind of stuff. And um, so you have that. It's so the the process coming to a decision on Capitol Hill is very different than the process coming uh, decision on on uh, these in the executive branch because of that just the orientation the way it's the way it's structured and they're just candidly really one big boss of the administration but it's always the president and um you know there are five, five 535 bosses if you will on capitol hill and all of them have their own different take on everything and um and very often there's there's not harmony and or not certainly not um a, a consensus in the early days on any any one issue right right um we see that uh, that's all i hear every time i take a shower in the morning and ask google to play me the, the news i hear about the lack of harmony um every single day i'm curious um and you probably get this question a lot too you worked in the trump administration um, I think generally regarded as a very controversial administration, um, definitely a subject of conversation from people on both sides of the aisle, did a lot of good, lots of policies, lots of decisions that a lot of people didn't agree with, um, you know, fans, you know, people that are really, really not fans, um, you know, pretty, pretty polarizing figure, I think Donald Trump was as a president. Um, and would love to just hear your sort of inside take on to the extent that you're willing and able to share um, what it was like being inside that administration. Yeah, like I, I, again, you can imagine I get this question a lot. I think it, the, the answer almost always surprises everyone. And that is that being on the inside was normal. It, there was no drama, no controversy. We were, I mean, I, if you look at what we did at the Department of Treasury, uh, the policies that we created, um, absent the tax reform bill, which Democrats just couldn't get their, their selves to, to endorse. But effectively, everything else we did was um, we either sought out, significantly sought out um, bipartisan voices um, and interests of labor and you know, kind of uh, cohorts and constituencies that were traditionally not be Republican. Um, and really ref try to reflect their views in, uh, on policies that we did with reorientation of Dodd-Frank. We actually wrote a bill with, with uh, Capitol Hill to change Dodd-Frank, and that was a bipartisan bill. Um, you know, that's something that, and Dodd-Frank, and for those of you who don't know Dodd-Frank, um, was a was a all Democrat bill the first time it came around. And so, um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's. Um, it's always this it's people scratch their heads every time I say this, but it's uh, working for the administration certainly depend and especially Department of Treasury, which tends to be a, a, a more bipartisan, more uh, kind of even keel level level headed um, uh, group because it's a, it's a very small group of people who actually administer the um, uh, you know, Department of Treasury, those that are confirmed, it's a small group, um, and uh, relative to other agencies, and the enormous import of the tr of the department. Um, uh, you know, it's it has a significant operations and and homeland security, and um, and we do, you know, CFIUS and um, uh, uh, you know, tra tracking dollars uh, against treasure against terrorism and. Uh, we work closely with the U.S. intelligence um, agencies on, the, on that side, and um, it was, we have an enormous amount of operations, tax treaties, and other things that we do. Um, you know, other economic cooperative cooperative agreements we have with other countries. So there's an entire you know, international side of Treasury that has, uh, you know, a bit, and if we just any of these things, if we kind of somehow screwed it up, if not we, but anyone that our treasury screwed it up, you know, that would have significant and significant impact in the overall economy, both here and in, in our country and abroad. So um, you have to, you know, take your job very seriously. And it's something that we did. And uh, I can tell you that everyone I served with at Department of Treasury really did 
um, lean in and, and really took their job extremely seriously and were very serious folks and so uh, smart and, and uh, capable. And so um, being on the inside looking out, um, I, I certainly, you know, I'm cognizant of, of the reputation and the and what the media, the way the media portrayed the administration. It just wasn't my, uh, uh, my reality from an inside looking out perspective. I appreciate you painting a, a clear picture, um, which I think is counter to a lot of people who were not on the inside, um, counter to, I think, just general public sentiment. It's helpful. I want to ask you another quick question. We've talked a lot about your experience in the public sector. Now you've been in the private sector, right? Joining Duff and Phelps, now Kroll very recently. I um, want to dive into why, um, what drove that transition? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what drove your decision to transition into a financial firm and some of the considerations you took into account while making that decision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I spent a lot of time in, in DC um, and there was a, um, uh, you know, I, I, I felt like I had, while, the, my, during my department of time at Department of Treasury, um, leading up to the, when I, the 18 when I left, um, so I served in 17 and 18, um, the, uh, we had really, uh, we had accomplished all of the major boxes that we wanted that, that were, that were to, to be checked, um, in, in the, in the administration. So tax reform had been done. We did a re reorientation of Dodd-Frank. Um, we had tackled some big cybersecurity stuff. We set up, set up a new opera stuff, cybersecurity. Um, and so it really kind of, and, uh, you know, wound down TARP and, um, and so there was just a lot of uh, there. Um, I kind of felt that the the major things that we had that we had to accomplish um, I, were done. Um, of course, in Washington, there's always a crisis around the corner, and it could be uh, you're, if you're waiting for another wait for an end of crisis, you're never going to never going to be done. Because of course, immediately after I left, the uh, um, uh, we had this crazy virus called. Uh, uh, you know, COVID nineteen that we we learned about, and we had then the Department of Treasury had to set up a new emergency loan programs, the PPP, and other uh, other loan facilities that you know really helped to, so, to stabilize the U.S. economy, working closely with the regulators. But um, but you know, up until that point, um, we had you know a relatively stable economy it was uh, growing in ways that had never been done before. Um, at the end of um, you know, many people forget, but the end of eighteen, um, you know the it did really irrespective of what cohort you were in, if you're white, black, brown, uh, you know, gay, straight, male, woman, um, doesn't really matter, young or old, um, you were really, financially, you were doing better off, you were better off than you were, uh, you know, really kind of, depending on the cohort, in the history that had ever been um, measured by the U.S. government. So, um, you know, I think that's, you know, it's uh, some of it's hard to, it's easy to forget that. Um, and you know, COVID has been so, such a disaster, um, you know, for the for the environment and sorry for the economy, as well as to so many people um, who un really unfortunately lost their lives over it and become very ill. Um, but it's uh, you know, before COVID, uh, we've done, we were doing pretty well as a country economically. Right, right, yeah, so, it's been. So I you know to answer your question quickly, I forgot the exact that question. So I we we had kind of checked all the major boxes. Um, I had a um, because I was confirmed as an assistant secretary of financial institutions. Uh, there were some really strong ethic law, ethic law, ethics laws preventing me from having any conversations with any U.S. financial institutions uh, for post government work, and so. Um, I you know made a major leaf a leap of faith and and left and um, after that had some meaningful conversations with some large financial firms in in, in New York, um, uh, finan uh, private equity firms, investment banks, uh, venture capital firms, but uh, actually it, it turned out that I, I very very progressive uh, a friend of mine who had started several investment banks and um, it was a. Carter administration official during at the Department of Treasury, um, uh, you know, started some investment banks in several of them and sold them. Uh, chastened me to to meet the folks at, at uh, then Duff and Phelps, the two two guys that that created uh, Noah and Jake, 
Uh, I did so on his urging. Um, I was pretty far down the process of uh, with some other financial firms. Um, and uh, they laid out a vision of uh, you know, significant growth, hyper growth uh, in a company. And really, genuinely, a year and a half later, we sold. Um, so it was it turned out to be a, a pretty good, um, again, very fortunate timing for me. And uh, and so yeah, it was it's great. And, and um, so that's why I went. I left. Why I went there. Um, it's a great firm. It's incredibly great. It's it's. It's grown so much even since our la our most recent acquisition, uh, you know, almost a year and a half ago. Um, so it can, continues to be gr to grow, and um, as just stewarded by an incredibly great guy, um, Jay Silverman and others, and the really executive pot, executive committee. And so, great. It's a great company. Um, and in addition to that, I do, uh, as you know, a lot of uh, in, uh, advising of companies, private companies. Of all different kind of shades, uh, shape and shape and and sorts, uh, mostly in financial, um, fintech and in healthcare, regulated industries, um, and to serve on several different kinds of corporate boards. Right, and now as you shifted into the private sector, you know, you're going to be on sort of this side of the of the fence, if you will, um, advocating for conscious capitalism. You actually mentioned conscious capitalism and the sort of movement that we're seeing um, earlier when you were sharing your story. And before uh, in our conversations, you've said that the world is evolving and that finance for just making money is not going to be rewarded anymore. Um, can you explain what you think will be rewarded in finance moving forward? Yeah, look, I think, you know, beyond what we, what we now know is ESG, what we call ESG, they're, um, the consumers of tomorrow uh, and the day after tomorrow um, are in, are driving toward and actually demanding that products uh, and services uh, be have a component of not just the environment but also a significant social change and and, and social justice, and so there's um, and so putting that as a as a component to a go to market strategy for any company and any product is now essential, um, and the but the backing of those companies also it needs to evolve because you're going to start start, start finding that um, although they may be next generation folks now we call them next geners and family offices people who will be inheriting the money that their parents uh, has, have made and, and will be putting that money to work those people um, are this are the cons are consumers of, of tomorrow and the, and the day after tomorrow and they all care about um, uh, having money be put to work and being raised and uh, in an ethical manner. And so, and genuinely um, more and more and more, um, there's an evolution toward impact. And so trying to find, trying to find ways of putting money to, to work while making money and also doing good with your investments. So, um, and there's just so many different examples of this and so many, uh, uh, and I really, I, you know, Ross and you and I have talked about this a lot, really not even three years ago, um, fund founders that I know uh, would say to me that you know, they would they kind of would brush this off and thinking like oh this is impact investing is more of a charity than it is a real investment strategy uh, not, not expecting a lot of uh, significant returns but that's just not the case um, they're the evolution of the consumer and what the consumer is demanding in their products and services is is allowing for a real significant escalation and and uh, 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 acceleration of of um of impact companies um that are you know and so uh and so you're seeing more and more of it and i think it, and it's interesting now three or four years later of the same fund managers that now have all of us all of them have a, a dedicated fund uh toward impact um and have an esg component to all of their uh, most if not all of their uh, their uh, their funds and invest in the investment thesis and, and strategies. It's absolutely incredible to see too. I'm I'm so encouraged by it, um, by this I would say groundswell, this tidal shift um, towards ESG and impact investment. Um, I was once speaking to somebody who said, "I can't wait for the day when we don't call it impact investing and we just call it investing." <laughs> Um, I think, Honestly, I think we're, we're, we're close to being there. I, I, I and look, the the U.S. financial regulators are, uh, you know, are looking at components of you know, actually regulating um, some kind of a, um, you know, 
and putting together some kind of a floor by which companies will be will be uh, judged on the ESG and ESG components and, com and capacity. And so, I think once that happens, um, I think you're I think the day will become upon us that you, it won't be impact investing. It'll just be um, you know course of doing business. Right. Right. Um, I actually just got introduced to Gene Rogers, uh, who was the former CEO of SASB and just joined Blackstone uh, by one of the, the senior execs at Blackstone who, who thought that uh, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about ESG a lot more right now at Scholars of Finance. That said, I think it's really important to talk about the current economic circumstances, how things are today. Um, the current projections of the economy are uncertain. Um, the Federal Reserve is looking to tighten fiscal policy uh, do you have any words to our listeners on what kind of outcomes we can expect to see um, as the Federal Reserve moves to make a decision, make some decisions in the coming months? Yeah, look, I, um, this, this is interesting. It's going to be recorded, so you can keep me honest and see. I, I play this back in a couple of months and see if I'm right. But um, look, I, I, my years of government exper experience and uh, uh, both in the, now in the private sector as well um, lead me to believe that we're look at. We're, we're in for a bumpy ride in 2022. Um, inflate, we're in a hyperinflationary period. Um, you know, Chairman Powell is, is a friend and he's a good guy, but I, you know, I, I think he was right. I was, he was, I called him and told, I'm sorry, I told him actually through the, through TV, um, in, um, uh, earlier this year, sorry, late last year, that that this the inflation wasn't transitory. It was something that was, you know, kind of unfortunately here to stay. I unfortunately turned out to be right, um, and we have now facing a significant challenge. Inflation, as you know, is a regressionary tax. It's borne most by those who can afford at least, um, and so there were so. Really, the people who are on the kind of left side of the bell curve, the economic bell curve, are the ones really feeling the the, the, sque the squeeze by um, high gas prices and um, you know absence of, of things on the store shelves and those th things that you can buy are more expensive. Um, so in the staples and so um, the real challenge is that anything the Federal Reserve is going to do. Um, that to keep to get inflation under control is also going to be really uh, it's going to be really challenging to the same people who are now feeling the, the feeling the squeeze from on inflation and so uh, raising interest rates is going to raise the cost of capital for people who live on revolving lines of credit um, it's going to make homes more expensive through mortgages um, and those kind of and things and, and then one of the more broad challenges is the federal reserve is going to have to, um, to grapple with is any any one point increase in interest rates is a three trillion dollar new new of new spending the government has to do to service that debt. Um, and to put that in perspective, the U.S. government spends three trillion dollars a year on everything we do in the U.S. government. So that's Department of Education, Department of Treasury, Department of Labor, Department of Defense, all of those important departments, all the things that we know. Um, Department of Interior, the, all the national parks, and all that you put all that together is about $3 trillion. So the Federal Reserve does raise interest rates by a point, and at that point, main, they maintain that point at, throughout a year. Um, that year, we'll, we'll take all the money we spend on, on the entire government and we'll have to be redirected to help service our debt. Um, and we'll have to somehow make up a $3 trillion hole um, that we have. And so um, it's a really complicated process. I, I oftentimes say um, that I am so grateful to, that, that Chairman Powell decided to stay in the job. Um, it's a job I don't envy at all. It is an incredibly difficult job. And the, uh, if he chooses not to raise interest rates, and, but does um, constrain monetary policy significantly by you know, tapering um, uh, and then stopping the bond buying program and then constraining actual capital, um, you know, that's also going to be really lumpy. It's going to be highly distortive to um, the economy and significantly to the markets. Um, one of the major challenges, again, we have right now is the average retail investor um, has never seen an inflationary period, nor have they invested in a, in a down economy, um, significant down economy. And so there's also some um, consensus around uh, absent ideology. So both from the left and the right, economists are suggesting that we're likely to see um, a recession going into Q4 of this year. And so if that if that's the case, we're in a, you know it's just going to be a really lumpy year economically. Um, while what where you know 
the markets may be um, a bit bumpy and uh, the impact of the um, policies are going to have to be rolled out by the Federal Reserve uh, and Department of Treasury and the White House to keep um, the economy from getting too frothy and, and uh, to put prices in, in check um, is going to be dramatically felt by everyone, but significantly more uh, by those that are, that are, um, you know, middle, uh, sorry, um, minimum wage earners and the people on the, on, um, kind of the, uh, those who are, who not, you know, don't make a lot of money. Right. Which I, 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 I'm not to bore everyone, but also is going to have significant impact in the upcoming November elections, um, which is likely going to, um, lead to, I think, let's just say it's your, I think it's going to be a very bad year to be an incumbent. Either if you're a Republican or a Democrat, I think it's going to be a bad year to be an incumbent. I think people are going to be really upset about the current state of uh, the economy. And Bill Clinton, former president, uh, said it best when he said that uh, about elections, he said they're always about the economy, stupid. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the time of this recording, I'm currently reading Ray Dalio's latest book, Principles for the Changing World Order, Why Nations Succeed and Fail. And um, when you look at some of the graphs and charts um, for America, for China, it, and you really examine our, our, the current cycle, the, the debt cycle, and where it looks like we are in, what, uh, the, the point that it looks like we are at in a debt cycle right now, um, at least when I'm, as I'm reading the book right now where I'm at, it feels like there's no way out. Um, do you think there is some path forward? There's, there's a needle to thread that our, our government and leaders can find? Look, I, I naturally gear to be an optimist. And so I will say, yes, uh, it's really hard to find. It's going to be, you know, finding a needle and with a uh, blindfolded uh, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a, you know, whole you know, field of needles. Uh, hey, but I think it's going to be, it's, it's going to be a real challenge. There's no question about it, but I think it's something that we're going to have to deal with because, um, unlike today, unlike uh, in the past, let's say it this way, many countries have not, throughout history, throughout, throughout our history of the United States, have not wanted the United States government to succeed. Um, today, we've, we face three significant foes that I think all of which would, would be very happy to, to eclipse the United States with, in both in soft and hard power. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're going to see some challenges by, you know, by Iran, by China, and by Russia, um, and you know, so you 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 put those challenges and compound them with the um, self-inflicted wounds that we have by spending too much money or by by taking on too much debt. Some of which is borne by those countries. Um, you know, I think that that we're it puts us in it can it could put us in a precarious spot, but I think that. Uh, Washington is very prone to act um, in crises and act quite quickly. Um, and so I think, that, you know, unfortunately, I think I'll probably take a crisis to, to, to force Washington to act. Um, but I think, it, you know, it will rise to the challenge when, when, they, when the uh, crisis happens. Um, but uh, absent that in normal course, unfortunately, it's this is a statistic that I'm not too happy to say, but the the government has never, at least in my experience and in, in my estimate, in my um, research, has never actually closed down a social spending program that it created. Um, in fact, what it does most often is creates a social program meant to stick around for a year and then sticks around and around forever and just keep giving more money to it. So um, we have this you know cycle of spending more and more money. Um, the debt has heretofore really never been felt by the American people. Um, you know, the, the significant ballooning of debt has never been something that, um, you know, has kind of touched the, the American, um, uh, you know, household in a way that's really meaningful. But when it does, and we could be at a place now where actually may, even this year, um, that, you know, um, I think it'll cause people to, uh, around the kitchen tables to be pretty grumpy about it. And that will lead to some it could lead to some policy changes in Washington, which are long overdue. I appreciate you sharing. Um, sometimes you have to swallow a bitter pill and you, you have to embrace reality and deal with it. Um, as Ray Dalio would say, to, to quote him at least, um, or understand reality and deal with it, as Ray Dalio would say. Um, I want to hit you. I know you only have a few minutes, Chris. 
would love to hit you with a few rapid fire questions, if I may, before we wrap up. Yep. Um, first, just tying to this conversation we're having now, I'd love to hear what you think all of our members listening should learn and take away from this incoming economic situation, this current economic situation that we're in and what's going to happen next. What do you hope we all learn from this and how can we have eyes wide open and maximize our learning over the next year or two? Yeah, gosh, that's a great question. And I could go on for hours on this one. So I'll go as fast as I can. Like, I think that certainly with the, the lens of, of the organization you built, um, it, it underscores the opportunity that companies have to be able to find ways of creating companies, creating opportunities, services, and goods that can be used and bought by folks that who are who are going to be hurt by this by the by this issue, by the by the by the economic uh, uh, crisis that we perhaps could be walking into. Um, it also really matters, I think, because um, because of this growing divide between the haves and have-nots in our country. Um, you can see it, uh, you know, by incredible polarization in, in the in politics. So you know, you have these you know people self-declaring them to be um, socialist and you have these crazy conservatives that are kind of want, want to create their own states and their own countries. Um, you know, on both sides, you have this, these, this incredible polarization. And that's a lot because of there's this, this huge chasm between what ha the haves and have nots. Conscious capital just has to be aware of that. Um, and we, there has to be a way that we can actually grow the pie so that everyone benefits. Um, and, uh, and that can be really um, dramatically um, felt you know, in, a, in a very uncertain economic time. And so um, you know, folks like you know, the, the principles that you, you um, promote and, and others that are, you know, those that are doing impact or um, ESG or uh, really kind of conscious capitalism in general have a real, um, uh, they perhaps could have a year, maybe a two years, three years um, of really um, leaning in and uh, really demonstrating uh, what this, this you know, kind of new wave of thinking um, can do and what, what it really can bring um, to, to an economy that's um, as big as ours, but also could be facing some challenges. Another rapid fire question for you, Chris. Um, there are a lot of people listening to this podcast who are either currently entrepreneurs, they've built their own fund, they are students who want to build a fund one day. Um, they are very, very seasoned executives and investors who are trying to act like a startup, who are trying to be entrepreneurial and innovate at their companies. Um, you advise a lot of startups, you sit on boards, you sit on advisory boards. Um, what, is, what are one or two key pieces of advice you would offer anybody um, trying to innovate or build something from the ground up? Uh, I mean, the first thing is obviously getting a great idea um, and, you know, protecting it. Secondly, it's really matters enormous amount with whom uh, you surround yourself. And so like uh, this, the, the people you work with are in human capital is probably the most important thing you're ever going to do. Um, and then I think um, uh, oftentimes I find that's a mistake is that people, companies, um, entrepreneurs are, want and need capital so badly that, that they think that all capital is the same. Um, I don't, I just genuinely don't believe that. So I believe that I always believe in strategic capital. Um, and you should not, I, I oftentimes tell entrepreneurs, um, even in a better significantly cash drop positions, uh, to not take money that is not, is not strategic. Um, you know, you have, um, you know, the, the time horizons are on, on when the company should be sold or acquired or you know, go public. That can be a significant mismatch if you get the right wrong kind of capital. Um, you know, there could be significant disputes and, and challenges of how to grow the company or, you know, which, um, you know, where to, how to launch the product. Anyway, there's just having an alignment with, um, the, your capital source um, is exceptionally important, especially in the early stages of a company. Thanks. And Chris, one final question for you. Um, you get a ton of speaking requests. You're incredibly busy. Um, and here you are taking an hour on this podcast to help the scholars of finance community. You've spoken to our students. You've been a great mentor and coach to our team. Um, made a lot of introductions to a lot of very, very senior leaders and great organizations to help us grow. Um, I'd love to know what stands out to you or stood out to you about Scholars of Finance and our mission. Um, why did you get involved and why would you encourage others to do the same? 
look, I think that you're you're building uh, an organization that would be would have been so impactful in my life um, growing up, and so I think that there's um, and it, I really liked when we when we first spoke that you, you know that the, the the challenge you're t- undertaking is building a new an army of people who are going to go out there after their MBA program or after their undergraduate program and become the next, you know, Ray Dalio's or, you know, the next masters of finance. And so um, if you get them early and you can try to, and kind of imp- uh, leave a lasting imprint on them and how important they, all of these uh, fundamental ideas are, um, you are going to have a significant impact in the next generation of, of how capitalism is raised and how, how capital is used. Um, and, and so I, I mean, it really became a no brainer because you have, because it's, all of those things are so important and so impactful, uh, into what I, what I have done and what I am doing, uh, and what I want to do next. And so, um, with that, it's, was kind of a, uh, no brainer, if you will, um, uh, aligning, uh, with you and, and knowing, and knowing, your, knowing your sincerity as well. And, uh, and all of these principles was also uh, very important to me. Thanks, Chris. I take that as very high praise and we're very, very grateful for your support. I want to thank you for coming on the Investing in Integrity podcast today. It was a total blast. would love to have you on again in the future and hope you have an amazing rest of your week uh, until we, we see each other again. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it.